Hi, good afternoon. I'm Eleanor Notides. I'm the chairman of the West Coast for Christie's. I want to welcome you to what is a really exciting program. Um, in fact, I can see we are up to standing room only, so we're very pleased. Thank you, guys. Uh, very quickly, I wanted to just talk a little bit about why we're here. Christie's has proudly supported FOG for the past seven years. We have, um, led by Susan Swig, who's right over here on her phone, um, so, but led by Susan, we've had really exciting programming. We've pushed the limits every year. We started, for those of you who don't remember, with Lisa Immerdino's uh, Peggy Guggenheim Art Addict, which was a lot of fun. We worked with Lizanne Schuyler on Brillo Box, three cents off. In fact, it was so popular here, it went on to screenings in LA, Dallas, on to New York, thanks to our colleague Michael Moore, and then was picked up by HBO. So there are possibilities here for you guys. Um, we also, colleague right here in the front row, St Simon Andrews, led us with Ames Forward. We had um, Chris, I don't see Chris right here, but Chris Perez um, and brought us Amy Siegel. So as I said, the bar is always high. So this year, thanks to my colleague, Michael Jefferson, we were incredibly lucky to convince Cindy, Cindy Strauss and Michael Friedman. Um, it, okay. I've done That's this Michael. twice. I've done it twice. I'm so sorry. Dennis Friedman, Dennis Friedman, Dennis Friedman. Dennis. To introduce Dennis Friedman, whose um, radical Italian design exhibition is opening in Houston in February, so just another month from now. It will continue on to Yale. But this is a sneak preview and what I think is going to be a really fun program. So I've asked Michael, so that I get the names right, to make the introductions for me. And Michael is a newer member of our staff sitting in Chicago. So welcome, Michael. Thank you, Eleanor. Welcome, everybody. Eleanor, thank you so much and the whole Christie's team out here on the West Coast and all of the people who put on the Fog Fair. It's a tremendous fair. And I really want to thank our two guests today. We have Cindy Strauss. Uh, the Sarah and Bill Morgan Curator of Decorative Arts Design and Craft at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, and Dennis Friedman, Collector, Advisor, an Art Director, Designer, All-Around Creative, uh, the Founding Creative Director at W Magazine, and currently the Consulting Creative Director at Surface Magazine, doing a, a, a rebrand, a resurfacing of Surface. So without further ado, um, I'll hand it over to you two. And can you invite the guests in the back? Yes, and if you want to step in, we have uh, more seats over here to the left, those of you that came in. So please, enjoy the talk. Thank you both. And if you can out here, here. put your hands up. Yeah. And, and we've all practiced biting our mics, but if you can't hear, I know you're able to do it, but just put up a hand and they will make sure that they will bite the mic. Perfect. Thank you so much, Eleanor and Michael. Um, thank you to Christie's for having us. And also thank you to the Fog Fair, and it's terrific to see so many people here for our program. Um, can we get the first slide up, please? Great. So this is the cover of our catalog. Um, as Eleanor and Michael said, uh, Radical Italian Design, 1965 to 1985, the Dennis Friedman Collection will be opening at the MFA Houston in mid-February. Uh, we encourage all of you to come down and see it. And we are going to give you a sneak peek, not only at the exhibition, but we're going to talk about Italian radical design, which is an incredibly important movement in design history, one that is not so well known in the United States for reasons that Dennis and I have never been able to understand because it's a passion of ours. But we hope that this exhibition will um, introduce audiences in the US to this very important movement. And this afternoon, what we're going to do is um, to get you all on a level playing field. For those of you who don't know uh, about the movement, is I'm going to go through a brief historical uh, preview or review of it. And then we're going to talk specifically about um, Dennis's collection, which uh, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston has acquired, both through generous uh, gifts from Dennis and also through acquisition. Uh, which gives us uh, the leading collection of Italian radical design in the United States. And this is an area that I've been collecting for the museum for about 15 years. But no question, the addition of Dennis's collection and the rarity 
qualities in it that you will see um, makes this trove really special. So without um, further ado, we'll start with a little bit of history. For most scholars and aficionados of the movement, the first moment in which it becomes clear is the 1966 Super Architectura exhibition in Pistoia, Italy, which is outside of Florence. And the movement itself really emanates from three major metropolitan areas, Florence, Torino, and Milan, though there are practitioners uh, in Naples, in Padua, in Venice, and elsewhere. Um, this exhibition really broke ranks with what was known as Italian bel disegno. So the production, mostly plastic, um, designs that were happening in Italy in the 50s and 60s that were geared towards the bourgeoisie to give good design and new design with new materials um, for new ways of modern living. And it was um, a continuation, if you will, of a lot of the ideals of the Bauhaus in terms of functional design. Well, the radical designers who were mostly architects and were trained at um, various universities and the movement really gains its philosophy um, as well as its conceptual and theoretical ideas out of those university programs. Um, they broke with all of that, those decades of tradition. And I think you can see in this image here um, that it's a different kind of total environment. There is a, it's, it's a riot of color, of texture. Uh, you have new types of furniture. Uh, you can see with this sort of slide wavy looking uh, seat um, for a new kind of living. And this show was so important, even though it was in a small town outside of Florence, it was relocated because of the terrible tragic floods in Florence in 1966. And so the show was originally supposed to be there. But for a small show, basically the who's who of the avant-garde architectural movements came to see it, including a gentleman named Sergio Camilli, who was the proprietor of a manufacturing atelier called Poltronova, which then started to put some of these pieces into production. And you can see on the floor those, um, what were the prototypes of the Passiflora lamp, uh, which we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. These were actually made out of cardboard for the exhibition because they didn't yet have the knowledge or materials of how to make this into a functioning lamp. This is a period in which collectives were incredibly important, and Arcazum Associati here, yes, they were mostly men. Uh, we do have one woman as part of Arcazum, which was a rarity, but she made a very, very big contribution. Um, note the lightning bolts um, on the windows. We'll talk about that in a little bit uh, later. And this was a time in which design was seen as very much objects of communication. So everything was functional, but function was not a priority. They were objects of communication, messages that the different designers and groups had about urbanism, about, um, in the case of the two lamps that you see here by Lapo Benassi, anti-commercialism. So you have the MGM and the Paramount lamp the symbols of American commercialism as seen through Hollywood, and these were sort of protest pieces, uh, if you will. All of the works that I'm showing you here are in the collection and in the exhibition. Uh, Dennis's collection is filled with prototypes, such as the one that you see here, the prototype cube for the Misura series by Super Studio. There's also um, pieces in which a couple were made, yeah. 
And even in the ones that had what I would call larger production, and we're still talking about maybe in the low hundreds, he sought after getting the earliest examples in original condition possible. So this prototype cube by Super Studio, um, which the grid obviously is the main, yes. <laughs> the main aesthetic uh, and conceptual influence um, for it. These artists were also very embedded with the contemporary art movements of the time, very much aware of them, participating in lots of activities with those artists and architects. And the idea behind some of these pieces very much uh, fell into a kind of utopian ideal. And by that, I don't mean a hippie utopian ideal, but rather one, and here's some advertising images for um, the series that actually went into production. But this idea of um, being able to have works that could function in a new kind of way for different living. So the advertisements for this particular line of furniture were all part of a bigger idea of kind of a, a, a quote, um, cosmic order on Earth. <laughs> Um, and a lot, one of the things that I think that you have to keep in mind with the pieces from the radical movement is today a lot of them seem funny um, and people think they're just really humorous, but these architects and designers were deadly serious about uh, their work and so there were very strong conceptual and philosophical underpinnings. Um, the idea here, and I love this advertisement, this girl looks so miserable. I mean, you know, she's supposed to be <laughs> in this happy kind of utopian world. Um, we'll contrast her really sour expression with um, another image that was used by Super Studio, which is more of the hedonistic, uh, joyous image um, on the right. So many of these projects existed just in drawings, watercolors, um, manifesti, et cetera. And this is um, an out, the furniture is an outgrowth of this continuous monument series in which um, they felt that a continuous architecture that came throughout the, the world would be nurturing as opposed to um, obliterating nature. And I think that nurturing part you can kind of see on the right hand screen. So many of the themes that were part of this movement resonate today. So this is a time when there's concern about the environment. Um, not only because in the early 1970s was there a, um, a energy crisis, but um, also about living with the environment, bringing nature indoors. So you have an, a designer named Piero Gilardi, who you'll see here, who so some of you may know is a key figure in the Arte Povera movement. In Torino, um, he very much created these objects that were put into production where you could bring nature inside. So you have the Pave Puma um, floor tiles or wall hanging tiles that look like stones with um, various different leaves on them that you could bring inside or the Sassi uh, the rocks that were chairs as evidenced by, again, I love these period advertisements. Uh, they show, and you can see in the background under the shelf, the Passe Flora lamp actually put into production. Um, but you brought your rocks inside um, and used them in a, a terrific way. He was the inventor of a material called gooflock, um, which allowed, it was basically like a skin over foam that allowed the foam not to deteriorate and to give strength and it wouldn't quite get so dirty and spillage and all of those things. He, um, here are some of his nature carpets that were shown in art galleries uh, throughout Italy and, and around the world that were uh, much more one-offs um, that were part of Arte Povera. And then finally, um, in Torino, the pop art influence things. And these are the, the objects that Dennis and I will talk a little bit more about because so many people just think they're really funny today and they forget um, that there was serious intent coming out of them. But the 1964 uh, exhibition in Venice of American pop art was such a huge influence on all of these architects and designers. And so you have things like the Pratone, um, these 
leaves of grass, if you will, um, stand about four and a half feet tall, and um, they're dense foam with a goof lock covering. You literally fall into them, and they support you. Um, on the right-hand side, Babylonia, an architectural playground um, done by Studio 65 and Torino as um, playthings for their daughter that then became a mainstay of um, a lot of educational libraries and schools in Italy. All of the tenets of this movement were disseminated through manifesti, through journals um, that really were based out of Milan, and Milan is the capital for uh, all of this dissemination. And these were journals that took into consideration architecture, design, uh, fine art, painting and sculpture, ideas of urbanism. Um, they were dense intellectual journals, but this was how you found out about things. And while they were dis uh, published in small numbers, they had an international audience, and so that's in one way that people found out about uh, Italian radical outside of Italy. But, f um, and, and Alessandro Mendini, who was the publisher and editor of three of the magazines over this period, was one of the key uh, figures. And what you see here on the screen is Monumentino da Casa from Dennis's collection. One of four examples that was made, one of two that survive, because as you can see here in a performance, um, it was set on fire in a quarry, and the idea behind this was commentary on sort of relics, uh, frankly. But for the United States, the main event in introducing radical design was MoMA's 1972 exhibition, Italy, the New Domestic Landscape, which was organized by Emilio Ambage. It was divided into two sections. One was objects, which was just that, uh, and the other was environments. And here is their incredibly innovative um, design for the exhibition. It's hard to imagine a museum spending this kind of money uh, today to create such an extraordinary vision. And this is just the objects section. Out of the 180 objects, there were about 20 that could be considered radical. And you see an advertisement here for Poltronova uh, that was in Italian magazines touting the representation of their objects in this show. And the three uh, objects that you see on the screen are from Dennis's collection. They're some of the earliest radical designs known by both ArcaZoom and Super Studio from 1967 and 1968. Uh, in particular, the chair and ottoman, which is called the Mies stool and ottoman, is still, it's the only one that's been in continuous production uh, since that date. But as I said earlier, when there, there was a rejection of Bauhaus ideals, if you look at the design of that, you have the, the chrome-plated steel, you have the cowhide, which is sort of Corbusian, uh, the, the Mies chair kind of stylized form, but then this rubber sling seat that makes it look as if it's completely unfunctional. The fact that ArcaZoom called it Mies uh, tells you all you need to know about what they were rejecting. And I also want to point out uh, Dennis's version uh, now the museums of the Passiflora lamp. This is one of three prototypes that were made for a floor lamp version, um, a taller version of the one that was put into production. So this really points to the lengths that you went to get the rarest examples possible. Give you a sense of the environment section, which the radical designers participated in, these were all about experiences. They were not about objects. And the New York press freaked out about these. They could not understand what was going on in the environments and the fact that these ideas were not tangible. Um, the objects that we are showing you today and that are in the exhibition are really the manifestation of these ideas. And then finally, as we get um, up until the late 70s, 
There's a lot of debate as to when the radical movement ended. Some people say it ended in 1972 with MoMA's exhibition because once it went into a mainstream museum, you know, all progressive avant-garde thought must be over. Um, there are other people who say that the movement really ended around 1975 with uh, the failure of a counter school called Global Tools. But I think for Dennis and I, um, as well as for others, we see a second flowering of many of the conceptual ideas. And that's through a collective called uh, Studio Alchemia, which is founded in 1976. And most famously, they put on an exhibition in Milan in uh, 1979 called Bauhaus. Again, this commentary on uh, modernist heroes. These were works done by a series of architects developing a new language, as you can see, of color, of texture, of form. It's very postmodernist, um, and these are sort of the early years of postmodernism. This is pre-Memphis, and I think that's a really important part to mention because these works were handmade, one of a kind, or made to order. There was one gallery in New York City called Art and Industry, which saw the show in Milan, brought it to New York. Here's an image of it. It was a total commercial failure, in part because this is how they advertised it. <laughs> These, I mean, there's a whole series of these images that they staged right outside the gallery in the bus stations um, that kind of showed that um, this was not uh, not only your 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 classical furniture, um, but the the dichotomy between old and new with this lovely grandmother uh, sipping her teacup. And the motto for this gallery was, don't be afraid to live with this in your home, uh, which again tells you all you need to know about uh, the reception of this material in the United States. Um, and of course, I think all of you know Memphis. And um, just to be clear, a lot of what we're talking about, this is the precursor to Memphis. Um, Ettore Saltzas was very much part of the radical movement. And there are works that transition in that 1981-82 time where they're sort of more of a holdover from um, the conceptual works of earlier before you get into the more commercial Memphis things. So with that, brief and very fast introduction. Um, I think one of the things that everyone always wants to know when um, talking to a collector such as yourself is what was the first object that you acquired and how that happened. So this is Capitello uh, from 1972 by Studio 65 out of Torino. So tell us, Dennis, how, how, did, how was this the ship that launched you know, the, whole the whole situation? Edge. Well, actually, I think uh, everything that Cindy's been talking about basically launched the journey because all of the things that you're discussing, I kind of came of age. I was at Penn State University, which is not known for its uh, art history program, more for its football team, but I spent most of my time in the library. Uh, reading about everything we're talking about. And I was, I actually was an art major making my own sort of statement pieces, but I was fascinated. And, and I thought that this was an extraordinary time, what was happening in Italy. It was all through pictures and, and, and then of course the show at MoMA and the book became my, really the guidebook. and. I happened to be in London in 1998, and I this is all obviously pre-internet, and I was walking past Christie's South Kensington, and in the front row is Simon Andrews. And I walked in, and there was a catalog that Simon had put together, a sale of Italian design. And I remember I opened the catalog, and it sort of changed my life because all of a sudden I saw in that one cell alone, there must have been eight 
museum pieces. They were eight of the earliest pieces from uh, that period of radical design. Uh, this particular piece is a Capitello, but what struck me about it was its patina. I knew that when it was editioned, of course, it would have been in an off-white color. But what's extraordinary is that this material develops an, a really exquisite patina, almost a crackle finish. Uh, and when I saw this example, I just thought, I want to buy this. Well, what I didn't, and I'm not the most practical person in the world, clearly, um, <laughs> nor organized, but I didn't take into consideration that I lived in a post-war New York City uh, a 12th floor building with very narrow doors and certainly not freight elevators. So what you can't see is that this is about yeah. uh, four feet wide and yeah, about a, almost five feet long. It's, yeah. it's a big piece. It's a big piece. Uh, but I bought it and then realized it may never get into my apartment. Actually, fortunately, it did. It made it by an inch or two, but it was really, I would say, three quarters of my bedroom was this <laughs> and my bed. And actually living with that one piece uh, really set the course because I felt the presence of this entire history, which is what we're talking about. And what interested me was the subversive aspect of this movement, the social political uh, aspect, all of, all of the underlying complexity was extraordinary. And I thought, oh my God, I'm sleeping next to this. If you're a collector, I guess you can, f many of you feel that. And I thought also having seen that catalog, I realized, my God, there were eight pieces, and I was making very little money. But I could afford to buy, I could have afforded to buy almost every single piece. And that was the moment I realized that I have this extraordinary opportunity to build a collection. And uh, thanks to Simon, who really was my mentor, and I mean that uh, it's just coincidental that this is a Christie's uh, <laughs> event, but it really was Simon who brought to London, to South Kensington, not to King Street, these extraordinary pieces. And again, there was no internet, so once I bought that, I would get a catalog in the mail, and you know that was magic. So this piece, which... This is a painted panel uh, by Arcazoom, the collective we introduced and, earlier. And it's so rare to see a painting uh, in as part of... This is really a, an object well, field. Well, I think that one of the things that I realized was I was not really just a collector. I was also an archaeologist because these were pieces that... You know, you had to discover, uncover, recognize. In, in this case, I was in Milan and I was walking down the street. I, there was a very good gallery, mostly known for Italian glass, and there was a panel against the wall. It was actually the, uh, one of a pair, the other to this, which unfortunately was shattered by a terrible Italian uh, art shipper. But. <laughs> still to this day kills me. But uh, when I saw it, I, I asked the dealer if she knew anything about it. And she actually said, well, no, I only know it's probably from the 70s. Well, if you remember the picture from Archizuma Sociality, there are the lightning bolts. And I knew about those lightning bolts. And I also knew about the television, the symbols that I saw in this this painting and I realized no this has got to be it's got to be somehow related to Arcazum. So I knew a woman who knew Andrea Bronzi and I sent her a photograph of the panel and said could you please ask Bronzi 
if he could tell uh, the history of this piece. And she got back to me and said, yes, in fact, this is one of two panels that, w that were painted and they were in the Poltronova showroom. So if you look on the uh, yeah. black and white image way in the back, you can see this painting right. hanging. And the kind of extraordinary circle is when we were putting the show together, I said to Cindy, you know, this is one of the panels and she spoke to... <laughs> I was at Poltronova doing uh, archival research and spoke to the owner of the company and the, who was, had been the former archivist. Yeah. And she said, you know, I don't recognize it, but I'm having lunch tomorrow with three out of the four living members of ArcaZoom. So let me ask them about it. So she sends me an email a few days later and says, I'm so sorry, but they say it's not theirs. They didn't do it. So I called Dennis in a no, panic. You sent me an email. Oh, sorry. I sent him an email in a panic no and way. said, I'm really worried about this. Three out of the four members of the, the five members of this collective say it's not theirs. And I'm worried, should we pull it from the exhibition? What should we do? Um, and, and Dennis I, said, no, it is, it's right. Yeah, I know it's I right. I just thought they're wrong. <laughs> and they were. And That's I knew the they thing, were. is and they were wrong. And we're dealing with older, well, older people whose memories maybe aren't as well, best as they were. That. That's thought, what I was realizing. I just, <laughs> I mean, I am stubborn, <laughs> for sure. And I just knew in my gut that this was, first of all, you see the paint strokes, you see, so where else could it come from? But fortunately, and this I think is one of the things that we haven't touched on, when I started collecting, it was collecting pieces, but also collecting books. And the key to, to building this collection had to be a library. And I would spend as much time, I was lucky enough to be working in Europe a lot, I would go to every single bookstore in every single city, and if there was one pamphlet, I bought everything I could possibly get my hands on, which was fundamental to, to recognizing work. And fortunately, there's a dealer in, in uh, Milan, Rosella uh, Calambari, mm -hmm. And she grudgingly gave me a book that was a, a history of her collecting. And this panel was in her book. And I, I assumed that she sold it to the dealer. So I knew that she had that piece. So I said to Cindy, call her. She is going to give you. And indeed, I called her. And she said, I bought it directly out of the showroom. Right. <laughs> and then uh, Andrea Bronzi, the fourth living member of the collective, yeah. um, you know, swore up and down, I remember it, this is, yeah. this is ours. And so, um, you know, it, it was a great research, right. uh, yeah. as you said, archeologist. And that's the thing is with a lot of this material, um, a lot of it's been lost to history because yeah. not that much of it was made and people didn't keep records. And um, it, a lot of the architects and designers have passed away in the past five years, the ones who are still living. Um, sometimes they're just not as, as focused uh, or they don't have their own records themselves. So it's been a, been a good journey. And this, this is a very interesting work. It is not technically part of the Italian radical movement, um, but it is emblematic of the creativity and the challenge uh, that a lot of these architects and designers were yeah. doing. So it is a sort of precursor starting point to our show. And it's Fabio De Sanctis uh, cabinet. And here's yeah. a better picture of oh. it. This was one of the great, I would say, moments of my collecting. I knew a woman in Paris who had an extraordinary uh, surrealist, futurist chair. I'd never seen anything like it. And she told me that it was by a uh, Roman uh, designer called Fabio de Sanctis, who, in fact, with his partner Ugo Sterpini, had a, uh, a business called Officina Undici. And she said, Fabio's still alive. 
So I, she gave me, by that time I think there was internet, and I got in touch with him and I went to Rome to visit him. And when I got to meet him, uh, by that time I'd done research and we talked and I asked him if any of his pieces were still existing. And he said to me, well, if you come back to Rome, I'll take you to what turned out to be a cow shed in the middle of the country. I went back to Rome. We drove out to, in the middle of the countryside, he opened a barn door and inside where I think it was the collection that uh, still to this day I, I uh, dream about. It had uh, maybe 50 pieces, all made by hand, all extraordinary surrealist work. Unfortunately, in, and again, story of collecting, we had made a agreement that I would buy 20 of them. And the day I was wire, about to send the wire, his partner called me and she said, we can't sell you anything. And I, I mean, I told her I was getting an Italian lawyer. I did. <laughs> I went through and what happened, I think he, his children found out. I didn't know that he was going to sell this, and they must have stopped the sale. So fortunately, years later, I was looking through a, a, a catalog of Dorotheum in, in Vienna, and I turned the page, and it was this piece, which happened to be uh, a piece that was bought by a collector had never left the collection, but in fact was the piece that was in the last show of Surrealist Art in Paris, and it's a piece that Breton wrote about, and he actually said, it's one of the wonders of the world. This piece was made for Venice, mm -hmm. and the sound of a car door opening and closing, mm. of course. These are fiat. Car These doors. are Fiat 600 car doors. One of three that were made. Yeah, and so I was able to get the piece. This also happened because Simon told me about a dealer <clears throat> in Milan, uh, Patrizia Tronti, uh, who had a very small gallery called Era Studio, and he said, you have to meet Patrizia. I did. And when I walked in the door to her tiny little gallery, I saw this. Which is um, Arano Palma's table sculpture from uh, 1971. This is one of those kind of holy grail moments where it, it's, it's on the picture of Domus uh, magazine, which is one of the most important design and architecture magazines. Uh, Palma was uh, part of the Arte Povera movement. And um, this table this the part has the an incredible uh, story to it about yeah. the way it was made. Well, she explained to me what happened. Palma drilled, it wasn't the only piece, but this was kind of the, he drilled whatever, a thousand holes in the table. And then in each hole he placed a woodworm and the worm ate through the table. And this is 1971. 71. And he recorded the sound. He recorded the of sound. the woodworm. So again, it was like part performance, part and, object. Yeah. And here he is, the yeah. man. You know, I, you just can't beat these images, not only no. for advertisements, for editorials, or the way, in this case, Arano Palma presented himself well, and his furniture. And we have a chair uh, also the, in the collection. The, Flip side is I bought that table and then I was looking at a catalog in an auction house in Genoa and I saw that chair and I thought, oh my God, it's another Urano Palma and incredibly bizarre. I mean, one yeah. of the things that interests me as a collector, I mean, I love beautiful furniture. You'll see I love the 18th century, 19th century, but the idea of good taste, bad taste, ugly, it's, it's all, uh, what is good taste, what is bad taste? I mean, to me, that's at, at the heart of it. And it's the more challenging a piece like that, the more fascinating I think it is. So I was very lucky I was able to buy this piece. No one was interested in it yeah. at all, because it was so ugly. 
and that I was able to buy it for probably one twentieth of what I bought the table for at auction. Um, so this gets back to why I said, yeah. you know, these are objects of communication, um, yes. and and they are really, yes. really challenging. Um, another challenging work um, that is such an important record of so many of the ideas uh, that were happening in Italian radical design is Ugo La Pietra's yeah, Archangel Metropolitani. Um, and this was a case where, again, I think each piece represents a different way of discovering a piece. There's a very well-known dealer in Milan, uh, the galleries, Nilefar, and uh, she has very, very uh, good, uh, good works and expensive works. And, but I always ask to go upstairs. I mean, I'm, first of all, I can't afford what's on the downstairs. <laughs> uh, but I, I went up into the second floor, and then I saw that. And at the time, which is most of the time, I had no idea what the history was other than it was Ugo La Pietra, who I did know and a uh, great, great. So uh, I bought the piece and it took me a while to research and then of course, what's fascinating about this piece, I knew there had to be a conceptual idea, Metropolitan Archangel, he was really, this is a found object, a pole that exists in outdoors he created a piece which he dragged through the streets of Milan, put in front of the subway station, and he was playing with the idea of indoor space, outdoor space, nature inside, and of course, the wings and the ray of light and neon. I mean, uh, to me, uh, you know, it was just such a compelling work. And of course, there's easy to make connections to a lot of contemporary art, which I am interested in. And so again, many times you have, it's your own instinct and your own knowledge, which in this area, you, you, you're left to your own devices. You are because really, if there are sources, they're mostly in Italian. And I think Dennis is uh, yeah. underplaying his, his eye and his instincts. Um, this work is incredibly rare. It's part of a project. Ugo La Pietra was an architect. He was a performance artist, he was a critic. Um, and this project, as Dennis said, these poles were in the Milan subway and outside the subway stations, they held uh, advertising placards. Yeah. And he decided that he was going to transform them. So he truly stole 20 of these poles, um, transformed them into, this is hand-painted, into these lamps. You can see him there um, on the image from uh, the early 70s. He then put them back in the subway stations and outside the subway stations and just watched to see what happens. Yeah. And there are very, very few of them that survived um, for obvious reasons. Obvious reasons. Uh, just to move on a little bit, we've talked a lot about the themes um, as part of the exhibition and just to show you a few more pieces in the show, um, the connections to Arte Povera with people like Ricardo D'Alisi and Ugo Morano, these are one-offs, humble materials, rethinking uh, ideas about seating. Um, New materials, of course, the 60s and 70s, we think of plastics and foams, and these are works by Studio 65 with pop art influence. And again, I just want to point out the graphic design for the advertisements is just fantastic from this period. Lighting is a very big part of this movement. We haven't really talked about it much yet. It's a very big part of our exhibition. Um, three examples here. Uh, the one in the top center, which is Boalum, was actually a production work, uh, truly inspired by a pool hose. For those of you who've ever seen the pool cleaning hoses, um, these are not lamps that you're gonna read a book by. Right. These are atmospheric lamps that are making statements about whether it's plastics um, with the Gerpa lamp and the lower, the pink and one, or the found say, object. And one of the things about the lighting, uh, Fulvio Ferrari, we, we, some people would know, uh, addition to book. And this book came out 
I, you know, I got one copy, it's impossible to get another. Uh, and that book was really a catalog resume of all the really rare lighting that was made during that time. So that book became my Bible mm -hmm. and one by one, I tried to get as many of those pieces as possible, mm. and I think we have about twenty I in think examples I ended up in the exhibition. Getting about twenty of them, yeah. And again, There's it's the one. <laughs> book that you see that then you start the search, and that's archaeology. Yeah. These are some of more of the Studio Alchemia pieces, yeah. but one thing that um, I really hope to express to you is the fact that a lot of these designs also had to do with new ways of living and yeah. interactivity. So here's Babylonia being carried around by school children um, in which they could uh, create their own architecture. But it's also a time of customization. And so um, one of the things that Dennis's collection is very rich in is maquettes. And so you see Gianni Petina's maquette here for the rumble sofa on, uh, made out of a terry cloth towel. Um, but here's the sofa in full size in his studio. And so one can imagine the late 60s, early 70s and having people over and just kind of communally relaxing. Um, the same thing, a little bit more structured, um, is Mario Bellini's Gilscacci tables, which could be rearranged, as you see here, as seating, as a coffee table, as uh, sculpture, architectural yeah. sculpture. Yeah. Our, um, one of the things we're really trying to do with this exhibition is to make sure that it is really situated in the moment in which these objects were created. And so, in a brilliant idea that I give full credit to Dennis to, um, he saw an image and said, and I'll show it to you in a second, yeah. could this be uh, our exhibition idea? No, uh, I said this idea. is going to be our, our exhibition, exhibition idea. idea. That's true. Um, and it is an image by Arkazuma Sosiani. I wasn't going to let you get away with not doing this. <laughs> I have to thank my director, Gary Tintero, for uh, going along with the exhibition idea. He didn't have a choice. Um, on, <laughs> this is a No Stop True. City, a 1969 project by Arkazuma Sosiati, which is probably the most important architect conceptual architectural project of this period. The idea of the infinity, utopian city, geometrically based uh, in which different functions could uh, happen. And it's a series that exists on paper. Um, on the top of this image is the model, the image that Dennis said, this is what we're going to when do. When I saw the picture on the top. So the whole idea of, this is a model that was never built. Um, for those of you who have been to Houston, you know we have uh, Mies van der Rohe designed building, one of the the only museum Mies designed in the United States. And so with the help of an architectural firm called Almost Studio in Brooklyn, we are building the No Stop City model pavilion and inserting it in the Mies pavilion. So the, uh, I'm gonna show you a few images of what it's going to look like. So you have this mirrored infinity room with the grid, the mirrored columns, um, it's incredibly subversive to put an ArcaZoom No Stop City model in a Mies Modernist 1958 pavilion. Uh, it is going to be phenomenal. That's why you it, had no choice. That's why we had no choice. Um, and, uh, and so come see the show in Houston because we're not sure that the model's going to travel. <laughs> um, and then just to give you a little inside baseball, you know, those of you who are on museum staff know that we play with maquettes for everything. So here's my model, which will show the objects on floating platforms within this infinity room, and you'll be able to move through it. And we want to wind up in our last um, minutes to have Dennis show you some images from Dennis's homes and how he actually lives with this material. It's a living, breathing uh, collection. And while we're looking at these images, um, I we want here, to, uh, to talk about two things. One is sort of, why now? Uh, why, why were you ready to part with this collection? Why is this the right time for the exhibition? Yeah. Um, and, and what it's like to actually yeah. live on a daily basis with these yeah. objects. Well, 
number one, when I started collecting, it was really uh, curating. The pieces, there's some here, but you'll see there's a warehouse. And that's my apartment. But, um, well, this, the reason sh showing this is how these pieces resonate with, I mean, uh, there's various sculptors and uh, artists, photographers, Jesse Reeves over there, but how the dialogue between ra these radical pieces and there's a 17th century drawing on there and a, a very sort of decorative mirror that is found in a you know old antique shop, but. It is this, for me, an incredibly rich uh, um, conversation. And without these pieces, I think it, it loses its, its vitality and richness. And But I never thought, whenever I bought anything, there's never any idea that it's going to live anywhere. In fact, most of it ends up in a warehouse. But for me, I did make my basement doesn't look like that anymore. It's unfortunately filled with, you know, furniture. But it was a gallery space. <laughs> but, um, but for me, it w the collection was always in my mind's eye. It was putting together the pieces. And, you know, when I see one piece, you know, I bought it. So fortunately, eventually, I did have the space to start moving some pieces into my home, my life. And, uh, I think it shows, and as you can see here, some of you may recognize the Nacho Carbonal piece, an early piece from his Evolution series, and then an early Martin Boss when he did the Cocon series, and then the Cinderella table in the back. So although this is a radical Italian design, I continue to collect to today very carefully, and I do think there are some of the examples of, uh, of works being created today that actually do have uh, interest. I think it's a very tricky time because, you know, with computers you can do some pyrotechnical drawing and have it CNC'd and in the end it's nothing. And I think that what's interesting is there are certain young designers who actually like a Yaris Larman bone chair, which I was also lucky enough to get. The basis is strong. His idea is strong. His concept is strong. But in the end, and I think it's a good way to maybe end, even with all of that sort of um, uh, conceptual ideas and everything, if in the end, to me, the piece has to be poetic. And to me, uh, every single piece I've ever bought. It was the warehouse. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, has poetry. And, and I don't say that superficially. I think in the end, the realization of the ideas, including everything that was done in the 60s, in the end is, a, you know, is an object of great beauty. Um, and I think that's been the guiding principle since I started now. Well, it's, it's fascinating because Simon is here and we met in 1998 with the first Capitello and um, 22 years later, we're in the same room and the journey continues. And um, so just I think finally, I would like to say that um, we are so thrilled at the MFAH to be able to have this exhibition. Um, Dennis has been so generous with us in terms of the collection, uh, his knowledge, his support for um, our endeavor. We met by chance. Uh, yeah. I had heard his name floating around the ether, but um, we met by chance at a dinner party uh, held by Friedman Benda Gallery after an Atori Sotsa show in, in 2015. And it was truly one of those moments where I felt like I had met a kindred spirit. And uh, during the dessert course, I think we just 
lost our manners and focused in on each other and spent the rest of the evening talking about radical design. Um, I had felt very lonely as a curator uh, because nobody else in the United States was collecting this material or seemed to really care about it. I think Dennis was feeling alone as a collector. So, happily alone. Um, so. Happily alone. Um, I, so it, it, it's just been a terrific partnership. Well, actually, which, I have one story to tell, which I think is interesting in terms of art collectors, or I, I don't know who's here. Or what, uh, there was one great art collector I, was, I met. His name is Daka Shuanu. Some of you may know him. Uh, he's in Athens, and he has, I would, uh, arguably, of course, one of the great contemporary art collections. And I was at W Magazine, and I went to Greece to do a profile of Dacus. And I saw his uh, exhibition of his collection, which was extraordinary and very, very, very strong, and I would say pretty radical. He was very, these were tough works. And when I went back to his house, Nothing wrong with Prouvé and nothing wrong with all of the designers who made those pieces. But I thought, my God, here's someone who has an extraordinary art collection. And he's living with these fairly uh, conventional furniture. And I said, you know, Dacus, do you know anything about Italian radical design? And he said to me, no, I don't know anything. I said, well, uh, I think you would be intrigued and he said well send me some books so when I got back to New York I thought oh my god why am I telling Dr. Shawano about <laughs> Italian radical design you know and so I never sent him any books <laughs> but and this I don't know comes back to Christie's so a year later or two years later there was a sale at Christie's and there was a Carlo Molino dining table and I think you would know better than me. I think it was over $3 million. And I thought, oh my God. That... Then someone said to me, do you know whose table that was? And I said, no. And they said, that was Doc Ishiwana's table. So I picked the phone up and I called Dacus and I said, was that your table? He said, yes. And I said, he said, Dennis, do you remember this conversation we had? And I said, yeah, I remember very well. He said, well, you never sent me the books. And I said, you're right. I didn't send you the books because, of course, I can't compete with you. And he said, well, I got the books on my own. <laughs> and when I got the books, I decided that I would sell everything that I had and I was only interested in 1968 to 1972 and the good part was at that point he said but I really need someone to advise me do you know anyone who might be able to do that I said well I'm very happy to but anything that I can afford I'm not going to tell you about <laughs> but anything I can afford I will and eventually he we did build he now has some of the great, great pieces that I, I could not afford. Um, and that began a journey for him as well. And that eventually he did an, an extraordinary exhibition in Athens of his collection of design and art that I still think is one of the best so shows I've ever seen. So we're hoping that we've inspired all of you. And uh, you will join our merry band of passionate people about Italian radical design. And um, please do you know, come to Houston if you can. We have a terrific catalog that's available right now at the MFAH's bookstore. It won't be on Amazon for another five weeks or so. But thank you all for coming and for um, being such a nice audience. And we... We're not going to do a formal Q&A, but if anyone has any questions, feel free, free to come up. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.